Hi everybody, my name's Neil. I work in the professional development department of Oxford University Press and we have Beverly Spratt here today who's going to talk to us about inclusion. Let me just introduce Beverly. Beverly started her career more than 29 years ago teaching EFL. She then taught English language and literature in a British school in Madrid. During her career she has been a tutor, a literacy strategy coordinator, primary coordinator and a head of third and fourth of ESO and a member of the senior leadership team. In addition, Beverly uh, is a CENCO holding the British National Award for Special Educational Needs and Disabilities Coordination. She's currently researching with the British Dyslexia Association and she has been commissioned by Comunidad de Madrid to develop and present a course on language acquisition. Beverly has developed training courses for teachers and school leaders in creating dyslexic friendly classrooms the niche training and dyslexia awareness and promoting best practice in the creation and management of inclusive settings, all part of the Sinise Inclusion Project. So thanks for being with us today, Beverly. Great to see you. It's great to see you too, Neil. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, well, this is a really interesting topic. So maybe the, the best thing to do is we can start off by thinking about how we can define inclusion. It means so many different things to, to so many people. Yeah, that's right. I think that that is the problem that uh, we need to, particularly in the context of this conversation that we're having now, uh, we need to define it. Um, so I think the most authoritative definition comes from the United Nations, uh, the Committee for People with Disabilities, and they produced that in 2016. And I think that is um, really the go to uh, definition. Um, and that I will uh, read out. Um, and they say, the UN says, inclusive education means a fundamental right to education. And it's, uh, then they go on to say that it's a principle, a principle that values students' well-being, dignity, autonomy, and their contribution to a society. So it's quite interesting if you look at those points that they mention that are fundamental to inclusion, each one is interrelated. Um, you can't, it'd be very difficult to imagine, wouldn't it, uh, a young person going into the world with a dis uh, disability or a learning difficulty and being um, con contributing positively to society if they didn't have a quality education and how could they have dignity if they didn't have that. So, so those are the principles behind it and I think that is the, the, the go-to definition. So uh, running on from that, I suppose, what we're trying to say is that children with a disability or a learning difficulty or any other disadvantage, because I mean, we've really got to think also about um, children uh, with um, social economic difficulties, then we've got the question of gender, of course, and um, ethnicity. Um, so it, what it means is that whatever um, disadvantage or disability or learning need those children have, inclusion means that they are in the classroom for most of the day and maybe they might have to be taken out occasionally for a special tuition, but they are in the classroom for most of the day. But it's interesting to think, to flip that over and think what it doesn't mean. Inclusion doesn't mean that a school perhaps can say, look, we've got 20% in our area that we, our catchment area, if you like, of children from disadvantaged backgrounds with learning difficulties or physical disabilities. So we are inclusive. It's not a numbers game. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. And it's uh, running on from that. It doesn't mean that we are inclusive because we put those children in with all the other children and we welcome them. That's not inclusion either. That is what we call integration. And integration is the inverse of inclusion. What integration does is it places um, a young person or a child who has a disadvantage or a dis learning disability uh, in a setting that they have to adapt to with very little support or resources. I mean, with all the best will in the world and all the kindness and all the patience, it's not going to work unless we have inclusive practices in place, which is what we're going on to. So uh, include, what inclusion is not is it's not integration and it's not a numbers game. Okay. How does this then translate into what we might call a whole school approach? Right, well, what a whole school approach uh, means is up until um, recent, well, I think now, I think if you're going to many schools, um, many teachers will say, look, I'm really doing my best. I'm working really hard here uh, to make sure that all my, all my children with a, dis a learning disability or a disadvantage is accessing 
education, but really um, who I'm depending on is the learning support department. And then the learning support department will say, well, look, we're doing our best here, but we're just inundated with work and we're really depending on our, on our management team. And, and so it goes on. Um, and so what the whole school approach means is bringing all those areas together. And if you like to use the analogy of joined up handwriting, so that it's all joined up and all co coordinated together. And then we can say that the responsibility doesn't fall heavily on one stakeholder or one group of stakeholders. So we, um, the work on the, um, the planning and the, is, is spread amongst everybody in the community of the school. So really a whole school approach will include the people that work in the dining room, the people that work in the maintenance department, the people that work in administration, the people behind the desk as you walk into a school that, you know, the secretaries or receptionists, and of course the teachers and the management and the leader of the school. Um, that's what a whole school approach is. Everybody is included in bringing about inclusion. Okay, so we're talking about whole school in the broadest possible way we could mean that. Okay, yes. so if everyone's included of course and it's a whole school approach but how or where exactly does a school begin to take on this approach how, how did do you get this process started well ideally first of all um if we're talking about spain right now that obviously the schools will be looking at the um the points that have been laid down in, in Lomley or um, whatever Ministry of Education, whatever country you're in, you'll be looking at your, your guidelines set down by the Ministry for bringing about inclusion. And then what, what should be done then is with those guidelines, you need to have a very honest re and in-depth review of what you're, what's happening in your school. Because we've got leaders in their offices, we've got teachers busy in the classroom, we've got the people in the dining room busy serving food, we've got people cleaning the school, uh, we've got the, the secretaries working very hard, and everybody's so busy just getting through the day. Uh, what, what we need to do is say, right, hold on, let's see what is actually happening, and a detailed review of practices. And that doesn't mean only to find out what's not happening. Sometimes when these, these detailed reviews go on uh, within businesses as well, you actually find out, hey, we've got people in our school that can do this. We've got people that are doing really positive things. And then we've got areas that we thought were working well and they're not working well. So in other words, the very first step is um, a detailed review of what's going on. And once you've got the feedback from that review, then you need to um, design your plan. But the mantra that is, you know, what help us remember that is, you know, plan, do, review. So find out what you need to do, make a plan to uh, implement what you need to do, and then put it into action, of course. Okay, well, so plan, do, review. I mean, that all sounds like quite the task. Who, <laughs> yes. who, who would be the lead in bringing about this change, and, and who's involved? Well, right. I mean, you say it's quite, it is quite a task, but it is a task. A, a complex task if it's only one group of people doing it sure. right so if it's only the management team doing it or it's only the head the you know the the, the head teacher or if it's only the the learning support department you know that that happens as well look you're the learning support department you're the specialists on special educational needs and disabilities you do it um what happens is the plan will be also inclusive you would implement your, you will design your plan with each area of the school so the people as i said before you know the people that do maintenance that run the building and look after the school the people in the dining room the teachers uh, the learning support department each area of the school each department of the school would have input into that strategic plan they will give their views and their ideas of what they see happening in their area of expertise within the school that needs to be done and adjusted to bring about change, to bring about positive change so that the school, the whole school uh, becomes inclusive. Um, and it's at the same time, it's really important to remember that inclusion isn't something that is done to people. It's not imposed on people from yeah. above because as soon, I think human nature, you know, we all know that as soon as somebody tells us what we have, we must be doing this, we want to know why. And people tend to take a step back and say, well, look, I'm doing very well where I am right now. 
and I'm going to continue to look after my 25 children in this way, or I'm going to continue to have the dining room organised, the tables and chairs, etc., organised this way. But if they've been involved in the planning, they've got ownership. Yeah. And if they've got ownership, then they're going to what they're going to be um, very enthusiastic about seeing their views and their ideas uh, put into place. I think that's a very good point about getting people involved in the, the decision making process and giving them ownership and them feeling a part of the of the whole thing. It's a bit like when you get kids now to write the, the school rules or the classroom rules, they feel ownership and they, they yeah. feel it. Yeah, and that all comes really, it, this comes from business uh, business plans. I mean, this, this uh, whole school approach is really based on change management theory. That is, um, mm, there are researchers that say a business is not a school and a school is not a business, and quite rightly. Um, but there are certain principles in business planning that you can, you can use and adapt to the educational setting to bring about this kind of excellence in, in inclusion, for example. Good. Okay, so we've got everyone's on board <laughs> yeah what happens next right so once everybody's on board well then we need um to make sure that yeah you mentioned before the leader right so yes of course then we have to make sure that the leader the leader that the leader has vision um to have and confidence um and enthusiasm for what's happening of course to be able to delegate and say, okay, you've brought these ideas to our plan, you've contributed. Now I'm going to trust you and give the autonomy to the department, uh, maintenance department, and I'm gonna give the autonomy and trust to the people, uh, the teachers um, in the science department or whatever, uh, to carry out those um, steps in the strategic plan. So then this uh, leader, if you like, I mean, when, when we were studying about, when I was studying about this at university, about um, strategic ch uh, change, um, they called them armies. Like you have little armies within the, within the institution and those armies uh, are working to bring about the, the change that they have um, contributed to. So it won't be just the leader, but the leader will obviously have to be very confident in, in when I say confident is sometimes people find it difficult to delegate and if they have trust in their team then they you know they will be able to delegate and their job will be much easier and everybody will be included in the process. Okay well thank you very much Beverly for, for coming here today and sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm for the topic with us today it's been really interesting. Thank you and just remember that uh, we will only know if it's successful if the children are learning and progressing well. And that also has to be monitored. And uh, that's an important point. Thank yep. you, Neil. Great. OK, thanks, Beverly. Well, hopefully we'll have you back for another interview soon at some stage. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.